Come with me and you'll see how to draw from your imagination. I will teach everyone in the nation. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Rodgon. I'm an artist. I'm a designer. I'm a cartoonist. I am a lifelong artist. And today, I get the pleasure of also being your instructor. So, if you have never joined one of my classes before, what we aim to do with our time together is to achieve a, a level up in your art. What I'm going to try to achieve today is to make you a better artist within an hour. And I don't mean just teach you how to draw something simple like, ooh, let's draw little squiggles and let's draw eyes. No, no. Uh, my goal this next hour is to make you open up your eyes to a part of your art skills that you have yet to discover or to help you refine something that you've already mastered. Welcome. My name is Rodcon. I do this every day, and I have been doing this for the last seven years. How are you guys doing? I am the world's least known favorite artist. All right, so today's lesson. Actually, let's talk about what we talked about yesterday, okay? What we talked about yesterday, we were talking about cute characters, and we were talking about how to make the cute characters actually be able to be drawn in every direction. Now, understanding that your shapes don't have to be complicated to tell a story is number one. Okay? Number one is you don't need a complicated shape to tell a story. And today's lesson is going to tell that because today's lesson is going to be how to create characters out of a little cylinder. We are going to be creating this little character with big eyes, and we're gonna have a lot of expressions for them. And we're gonna call him, I don't know, Mr. Mr. Mellow for Marshmallow. Hello, Mr. Mellow. So now we have Mr. Globy, who is a little globe as our training method. And now we have Mr. Mellow. And Mr. Mello will teach us how to tell expressions simply by overlapping shapes. We're not going to draw any sort of hand. Uh, I guess we can draw little hands. We can draw little floating hands, okay? So that we can give them, like, things to do. You know, maybe he wants to go hunt down a dragon and collect the eyeball. You know, we're going to play a lot with uh, the idea of understanding a basic shape and being able to tell a story with it. Because a lot of the times we forget, we often forget that the whole concept of art, it's all about storytelling. It's not, it's not about anything else. When you, paint a, when you paint something, what are you doing? You're trying to tell a story. You're trying to tell the people what it was like for you when you saw that beautiful landscape. Right? When you're trying to capture someone's essence in a portrait, you're trying to capture that essence of time when they posed for you or what that person did to inspire you, to make you feel like you wanted to capture that moment. Capturing that moment, essentially you're trying to capture that moment in time, that story, that memory. So you, as an artist, we're constantly trying to record things as they're either happening or they haven't happened yet. So we're like seers <coughs> because I can, act, I can just sit down and predict that something's going to happen and draw it. And that would be the same thing as the people back in the days in like Greece and stuff like that. Like, oh, there's going to be a flood and I just have to draw somebody in a flood. Oh, no, it's a flood. Oh, it's so bad. Like I would be. <laughs> I would be so powerful back in the day if people didn't value art so little. <laughs> it would be so easy, so incredibly easy to be like a prophet or something like that if you had a little bit of artistic skill. 
But anyways, today's lesson is going to be starting when we get to 3,000 likes. When we get to 3K likes, uh, I will begin our lesson. But until then, I'm going to teach you guys a little cool something. Okay? Um, basic shapes. The reason that we learn basic shapes is not so that we can just uh, draw circles and do happy faces and stuff like that. That's awesome. It's lovely and it's really cool and it makes things really cute. So you just add a happy face to anything and it looks awesome. Okay? So don't, you know, don't. Uh, skip on this skill, it's really cool. But understanding that your happy faces can be very expressive without being very much more complicated, it's really, really cool. So imagine that you start with a happy face, right? Just a happy face, and you know how to draw happy faces like a pro because you know, you've been doing it your whole life. You can even make them with open mouths and stuff. You're like, yeah, right? In order to just upgrade this, consider that that little eye is going to be the inside of your eye. And then you just draw your eye outwards. Okay? So that's going to be step number one. Step number one to upgrading your happy faces is going to be drawing your happy face and then using that as the inside of your eye to draw a more complicated shape. I like to draw two lines intersecting with each other and making the top one darker to make an eye. Okay. You can choose the level of style and look that you want, but it could be that simple. One line, two lines, darken this one, add your style. Ta-da! Adding a different eye on the other side, it's just about the peaks of the eye. The peak of the eye consists like this. Okay, So if your eye, if the middle of your eye, the peak, is in the middle it's going to create a frontal looking eye by creating two intersecting lines. One bigger and darker and one lighter and thinner. This is going to give you the eyelash line. You can choose to then add any sort of styling to this and to this bottom line and you got yourself really cool eyes. Now, this overlapping line right here becomes your tear duct eye, and it becomes the initial part of your eyelid. On this side, this is the rest of your eyeball. <laughs> so you already have your eyelid and everything as well. How cool is that? So, happy face. Inside of the eye, inside of the eye, you go one big, long, curvy line. And an intersecting little line. The peak, if I need it as a three-quarter, this peak goes not from the middle. It goes on the three-quarter point. So it lifts up at the part where you need it. Okay? So if you draw somebody three quarters, your eyeball is a three quarter two. Do, 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 do. Your happy face leads into that too. Okay, so understanding a happy face, a very simple happy face already gives you the initial levels of a mapping system. We just don't use it to its full potential because we think that it's something dumb. We think that it's something that a kid could use. But yeah, it's something a kid can use to create something amazing. <laughs> because drawing a happy face is not very hard even in space, right? But if you knew that you, all you had to do was that, to draw something looking up, would you be, like, how in the world is this difficult? If you want to add a nose, it's adding a little triangle in between. And I'm going to show you guys that too. So understanding that all you need is to know how to draw happy face on anything. 
any shape. Okay, any shape you choose. If you draw a happy face with different girths, different situations, different positionings, and you just use that as your mapping system to be able to understand where your less of your elements go, you can create a variety of things beyond what you have ever imagined. Because you already know how to do this. You just don't know how to apply it yet. And when you do, you'll realize, oh, shit. All it took is two basic shapes. What the hell? <laughs> it takes whatever your happy face is and a triangle. The triangle gives you access to the rest of the face very quickly. The triangle gives you access to your chin, your mouth space, your eyebrows, and your cheeks. It's a beautiful little shape. Then combined with a little bit of knowledge gives you access to the whole face. If you want to create a more realistic one, all you got to do is create a box, a box, not an oval, not a little tapered, nothing, just a box. Draw a triangle and draw circles that cover this whole space. Now that's your eye socket, this is your temples, this is your nose, this is your cheeks, this is your mouth space, and you can create a human really quickly based on that. Your proportions become a one, two, three. So all you gotta do if you wanna create anything else in a different view is divide it into three. Do, 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 triangle, there, man, do, 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 and then whatever is left over, it becomes the side of your head. So you always start with the box. <laughs> you can do it a cube if you want. A triangle, circle, circle, circle for the side. This gives you your teeth and your chin. From here, you divide this in half, but at an angle, not up and down, but a slight angle, so that you have access to drawing your jaw. When you draw it from the profile, you're gonna draw one, two, three, and you already have a two, three, two, three going up. So it's very easy to find all your parts. When it's three quarter, you round out this side. <clears throat> Cheekbone going into your jaw, and then everything closes up. So a little box now taught you how to draw a human skull. When you master this, right? when you master all this, you are not going to even draw the lines. You're just gonna use those mapping points in your brain. Right? You're not gonna see that. You're not gonna see all those lines that I'm drawing. You're just gonna know like, where things go and you're gonna essentially be able to draw anything you want. That's how I draw absolutely everything. I just find the proportions that I want. Here, it doesn't even have to be cartoony. It can be exaggerated. Like the box, right? I'm drawing it a normal box like this and keeping all the parts even. So it's one, two, three, one, two, three. If I want three quarters, I just add a circle that matches the box. Right? That's an easy way to draw simple characters. But if you wanted to exaggerate them, most of the exaggeration is not going to come from the top of the head. It's going to come from the bottom part. The top of the head stays relatively the same. It's the bottom part that can be either really big, or it can be really small. It can be absolutely anything. You can even remove the bottom part for animals. Most animals don't have a chin. So all you need is a triangle 
than that. Most animals don't have a chin. So you don't have to draw a ridiculous like situation for them. It's just a little box followed by a little potato. And you have yourself little cute animals that look a lot better than when you try to like add all these weird things to them that we don't they don't have. Okay? So understanding and looking at the world, stop just reading books, stop just following tutorials. Uh, stop listening to other people all the time. Go and actually study yourself. Think of yourself like a journalist. Think of yourself like uh, like a journeyman, journeywoman, whatever you want to call yourself. Think of yourself as like Charles Darwin. Okay? And your goal is to observe humans and get to know how they move. And then when you're done with humans, you move on to plants. And then after that, you move on to other animals. And then eventually you'll realize how similar everything is, how similar everything is in conjuncture with each other. And you start realizing, oh, things like this are just cylinders, huh? Just cylinders and cylinders and cylinders and cylinders. And then the styling comes from observing life. I have drawn countless thousands, probably tens of thousands of trees. So I know how their like, core like, separates. I know if I need to change the direction of them, how to make it look like that. I know how their tree roots go into the ground. So if I need to make a really big one, I can make it look like it's encroaching onto the areas around it, right? I know how to do all this because I have gone out and actually drawn that. Because I observe it, I thought it was cool, and then I was like, ah, oh, dope, let's draw that. Like, because I don't see life drawing and studying as a chore. Because I don't see it as boring. Because I don't see perspective and anatomy as something I have to avoid. So if you're wondering, why is it not easy for me? It's mostly because of that. Because whenever somebody finds something boring, I find it entertaining. When I can't understand how to draw something up, like a chin, I don't give up on it. I draw it until I get it. And then I don't stop drawing it in every single way I can possibly draw it until it's just hammered so far into my brain that I don't have to think about it. Right? And then if I get to that point, then I get to be creative as all hell. I can put that into anything I want. So if I spend a month, a year, a decade trying to get it because I really want this, right? Because I really, really want this. I, I don't understand about you. I don't know about you, but I really want this. Like, I don't care <laughs> about anything else. I really don't. Like, and, and you can talk to people in my life that have met me before. I don't give two hells about anything else except either succeeding in a way that I feel accomplished or creating the life for myself that I have always wanted. And I'm not giving up 40 years down the line. I'm going to keep doing it because I've successfully had the life I've wanted for 20 years now. All thanks to me just doing what I want. <laughs> like, and that, that's essentially it. But that is the motivation for me. I wake up every morning trying to be a little bit better by the time I go to bed. And that's been the case ever since I was in, in college. Ever since I decided to make this a career, it was like every night I go to bed, I better have drawn something that taught me that I was a better artist by the end of that day. And it's been like that for 20 years. You get a lot done in 20 years, even if you suck at art. Even if you're horrible, even if you do not know how to draw anything, even if you have no creative input in your brain, you can train all that because I did it. I did not have an inkling of natural skill, none at all. I just wanted to draw. That's it. That, that's all I wanted to draw. I didn't take a... a 
I didn't take a men uh, a pretty good ride uh, to a law school because I didn't want to argue for a living. That's the other thing I do really good, by the way. <laughs> I very, very, very much so uh, fall. I feel sorry for whoever picks an argument with me uh, most of the time because I just don't lose. <laughs> but on the other hand, I'm just I just find it fun to argue. I find it really fun to argue. It was something that I liked to do in college, and it's something that I liked to do in high school, and it's something that I liked to do. It. The, like Arguments, discussions, debate was always my, my thing. I just wanted to see how much I could portray my thoughts onto other people. I was a teacher before I even knew. <laughs> I've always wanted to just help people understand what I do, and I was like, my way of doing it was through discussing things and making people see things forcibly, which is not the best way to be a teacher. But as you progress and you learn and you get older, you learn about like making sure that people actually learn the way they need to instead of the way that you want to. And that was one of the biggest things that I learned as a educator. It was that if I try to adapt my way of learning to how you guys draw and learn, you'll never learn anything. I can also never because I have 20 something years of experience and that experience came in stages. It's not something that just came in and was like, oh, I can learn this and I can do this now. Oh, I'm now amazing. I can draw like the best character. No, it doesn't come like that. It comes in stages and people learn little by little. Little like one thing clicks and another thing clicks and then another thing clicks and then another and then another and then everything converges. And then there is a convergence point. There is a point where everything is like, oh, 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 shit. Ah, okay, cool. Now this. Oh, my God. And then this. Ah, and then you'll start just seeing the connections between everything. And when that happens, it's beautiful. I've seen that happen with people in front. Like I've seen people get that like in front of me. And it's just the most lovely fucking thing in the world. Like, like you see the eye just light up with so much joy. It, it's like if a person fell in love. That's the only way that I can describe it. It's like a person just eventually, literally just fell in love with the concept of their brain. And it doesn't take very much. It doesn't take very much to be able to, uh, to unlock that. But it takes a willingness to do so. And that willingness is not always there. Because uh, we're stubborn. Because we don't like to backtrack. Because we don't like to uh, think that we didn't learn right. Because our ego is going to know way. And our egos are the, literally the one thing that hurt us the most because like if we just actually understood that something was hard like i don't know basic perspective and shit right like if you just admit that it's hard but you work at it you'll get so much further that if you just think and think that you know it that you if you falsely tell yourself you understand it because you took a perspective class in fucking high school don't no, <laughs> no, 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 no. You don't know perspective if you've only taken a high school class. Okay, you don't. I promise you, you don't. If you've only learned perspective through the whole little horizon point thing, right? Yeah, that's beautiful. That's awesome. That's lovely. But that's probably not the way that you're going to want to draw your characters. Most of your characters are going to be isometric perspective. And that's perfectly symmetrical perspective, right? Most heads and bodies don't taper as they go smaller. If you go three quarters, if you taper this, right, it becomes a lot harder to be able to do the curvatures that you need. If you taper it, that's when you get people that think that their eyes are smaller on one side and bigger on the other. Doing this type of perspective for characters is, is not the best. 
when you don't do that type of perspective and you learn isometric perspective, everything becomes a little easier. Oh, magically, that looks like a human. Oh, I wonder why. And then you can combine that with the other perspective for your body, if you need to. And mic drop. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, it throws off so many people. So if you only work and learn through one method of perspective, understand that there's other ways of drawing that help you understand things a little bit better. I don't know. I find that easier. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now let's go on to our lesson for today. Our lesson for today is Mr. Tater Tot. Now, Mr. Tater Tot, or Mr. Mellow, as we were going to call him, Mr. Marshmallow, is a requested lesson from one of my apprentices. Now, he has a little character that he uses for his comic, and he has him be a little, you know, like little tiny character like this with big eyes, kind of looks like a baby SpongeBob kind of. Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to give you guys ideas of how you could take something as simple as this and be able to make a move, run, live, and pretty much be alive. And we're going to do that through our basic shapes. So if you guys have been liking what I'm doing so far, get me to, I don't know, get me to 20,000 likes. If you guys feel like sharing... The stream, that also helps. I, I don't know if it helps that much, but I know it helps a little. So if you guys want to help, that's a way to do it. Okay. So let's see. Mr. Mellow. Mr. Mellow is a cylinder. A cylinder comes from understanding how to connect two circles together. If you learn how to connect two circles together of different widths, you get cylinders at different stages, okay? If you draw them skinny, you have the care of the cylinder standing a little bit more up. If you draw them more full, this is gonna give you more like a 3D effect. You're gonna be able to see the bottom or maybe that's the bottom and that's the top. So cylinders are really ambiguous. You can choose either one of these and be able to make them a top or a bottom. This is why they become excellent animation tools. Okay, absolutely excellent animation tools. And why this type of character design becomes an incredibly simple character to draw. Because this and this are both the front and the back. I just get to decide which one's the front and which one is the back. And as you learn about turning and twisting your shapes, you'll see how you can only see one side at a time if you have a character looking from the back, right? If you arch them, you wouldn't see any of the tips from the front. So it becomes a nice, simple pill. And then from the back, you get two little surfaces that you can use to be able to make the top and the bottom of your shape. So that is the very first inclination of knowledge that you're going to need. Uh, the next thing is we are going to be using a squishy side and a straighter side. Right? So if we use a squishy side and a straighter side, the squishy side is going to naturally be a little shorter. The stretchy side is going to be a little bit longer. We're going to use this to be able to generate compression points. Compression points are how you essentially create depth between things. If you compress two things enough, they overlap. And you can create a lot of movement even for something simple, like a little beanbag, like a little cylinder, okay? So when you start adding things like eyes and a mouth, you're gonna want to be able to move that anywhere you want. And by finding that long side, you find the front side of your face because 
So it's going to be easier for us to be able to move this around. Got it? And then when you want to rotate him, all I have to do is rotate the bottom, rotate the top, and I can have different looks for him. But then all these features have to move too. Good morning, love. How are you doing? Okay, I'll give you a little side lesson on hands right now, okay? A hand is not really all that hard. A hand, you can start with a box. Actually, make it a rectangle. Make it a rectangle. Split it. Now this becomes your wrist. <laughs> this becomes your wrist, and this is going to be your hand. Draw a circle coming from that circle that you drew to divide it. And now you have yourself the base for your thumb, okay? So the circle connects here, that's your connecting point, your wrist. Then from there, one side of your hand has a finger, right? So outside, you have a finger. So you draw a finger and you bring it back in. The other side of your hand has a finger as well. You find that finger and you draw that. In between, you have two more. The thumb cuts into the wrist, and it creates that division. So if you just keep those things in mind, you can have your wrist and your arm be the same girth, just the same shape, just bent at whatever connecting. From there, you draw a circle to generate the base for your thumb, and then you find the two sides of your hand that don't have to be the two sides of this box, it could be like right here and right here. Uh-huh. Be creative. In between, there's two more. You can combine them if you want. And then you have the top, the bottom, and the wrist already. When you add little things like a ground or little laser beams coming up. Pew, 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 pew. So let's do that one more time, and then we'll move on to our lesson, because I think you guys got me there, right? Yeah, you guys got me there. So we start with our box, or whatever two shapes that are going to be our wrist and our palm, okay? This could be the wrist. Just make sure that the connecting point and the palm are the same size. Same size. This circle that connects both of those two is going to be where your thumb comes out. You can draw that thumb anywhere along the line of this. It doesn't matter. As long as it connects, you can draw it there. And it's going to look good. Okay? Start with your thumb from there. Then from there, use your thumb, the width of your thumb, to generate the width of your first finger. Connect the top of your thumb to the top of that finger, and you're going to generate the top and the bottom of your hand. It's all about connect the dots, guys. It's all connect the dots. Everything is connect the dots. I wish I had my other sketchbook with me right now, but actually I do, hold on. I do. Let me show you guys what I mean by the hands. So this one's gonna be scanned and it's gonna be sold. I think this one's gonna be the base for the big book of little lessons. I'm going to use this one and then I'm going to fill it in with other lessons that I've like, taught because this one was a really complete one. This one was a really nice one. Um, okay, so here you go. So lesson time. All right, so your thumb and your knuckles. Now here you go. Here's a better example. Your wrist and your palm are very much similar in size. They're very similar. You, you can even look at your own hand, right? Look at your own hand. Tuck in your thumb, tuck in your pinky. It's actually not really all that different. It's like pretty straight on the inside. On the outside, you have a little bit of your thumb part. You're like, but that's just your, your squishy part right here. 
right? So that can be accounted to with just the pinky being a little extended beyond that. So once we understand that first part, then we have to understand how the thumb works. And the thumb is normally like brought out as part of the hand, right? But I don't like to think about it like that. I think about it as an entirely different appendage. Like I don't even consider it part of the hand. Like I, I find it to be a mapping point in something that just goes opposing the other one. So I might as well even just think about it as a completely different element. Uh, so when I'm drawing the thumb, I'm not considering it when I'm drawing my hand. <laughs> I consider my hand with my fingers first, and then I find that connecting point and I find my thumb from there. To me, that made so much more sense. It was so much easier to draw hands if I just took away the one element that was hard, right? Which was figuring out the thumb, put it in at the end by knowing where it connects, and it just became so much easier to draw hands. Um, just visualizing it a little bit different normally is the key difference to this. Uh, just being able to, hold on, let me find another hand one so that we can fill it in a little bit more and also give you guys a little baby lesson. Hands, 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 hands. Air like tentacles, hands, 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 are so freaking cool. Uh, okay, so here we go. All right, we have a little bit more space. So as you guys can see, the simplification of it can come... Where's my black pen? I just had it. Okay. So the simplification of the hand can come down to drawing two shapes that overlap each other. Okay? and then finding which one of these you want to make into the hand. Uh, in this case, let's make it this side, okay? Actually, well, let's make it this side. We haven't drawn anything going down. So if I choose that this is going to be my hand, I just need to figure out the two sides of it, which will give me my index finger and my pinky finger, okay? That is going to give me my knuckle. My knuckle is going to dictate the top and the bottom of my hand. Why? Look at your own hand. This bone right here, the top one, that's my knuckle, which is the top of my hand. This squishy part is my bone. That is the bottom of my hand. Therefore, this circle is the width of my finger, my hand. That, oh, it's a little off. But that is the width of my hand. So. Any of these is already giving me the width of my hand. Whenever I draw my wrist, I could draw a circle, and now I know the top and the bottom of my hand. Right? So now I just have to draw four more and connect them, and I have myself my hand. So now I'm not limited by any shape. I don't have to draw a box. I don't have to draw a cylinder. I don't have to draw shit. I just draw my wrist into a circle. In that, I normally draw a lollipop to make it easier to identify the top of the hand. But from there, you have the width of your hand. So this is the top and the bottom. I just get to dictate which one or how it connects with the other fingers. And then from there, it's just a tapering of two sections. I know it's three, but I'm going to show you guys how to divide the top one. The thumb comes from here, and that's my base, and I can decide my thumb very easily. Right? So understanding your hand has always been incredibly complex for people, right? Understanding, oh, what do I do once I find this? Once you find your wrist, your wrist, double that size in a different direction, and then draw yourself a circle. That circle is going to give you the top, the bottom of your hand, and then from there you can decide what to do with your hand. You can bend your fingers, you can do whatever you want. 
Maybe he's bowling. Right? Understanding your hand. It's just about understanding three circles. <laughs> Wrist, circle for your thumb, right? Circle for your index. Connect your thumb and an index. And then find your pinky. And then you have yourself a hand. Ta-da! <laughs> Again, not all that complicated. It's normally just taught very difficult. Most of the time, a lot of the lessons that we learn, people want you to learn every single facet of anatomy, right? They want you to understand every single element before you can go in and draw something cool. And even though I am a big proponent of understanding everything before you go in and add a lot of style, you don't really need to know absolutely every detail of anatomy or uh, shadows and lighting. You don't even need shadows, by the way. You don't need shadows. You don't need shadows until later. You don't, I, you don't need to learn about values until way later. Way later. Like, it's not even one of the core 10 foundations. Not even close. But so many people think that shadows and lighting is like the most, ooh, I need to learn how to do that because that's the way you make it look real. You don't need to make it look real. You don't want reality. Most of you don't want reality. You guys want movement. You guys want flow. You guys don't want reality. Because if we wanted reality, you just copy a picture. If you wanted to draw something fun and animated and movement, you don't need it for it to be real. You just need for it to look like it has movement. And that is taught through flow. Not detail, not lighting. <laughs> flow over lighting. If you want to create better things cooler things. Most of the stuff you guys see does not have any shadows. Nothing. If, I don't know if you've noticed that, but in my sketchbooks, you hardly, hardly you see a shadow. Most of it is just contrast. It's just contrast between two colors. I don't know if you guys have never noticed that, but the amount of depth you can get through just your line work and some contrast is all you really need. You don't really need or require the, the need of any sort of shadows to be able to create depth. It's all about how you overlap your lines. And if you can get that and, and combine that with your shadows, well, that's how you get things like this. Welcome to my book, Coffee Break Doodles. Doo -dee -doo -dee -doo -dee -doo -doo. When you start combining shadows with your good line work, because I used to actually spend time doing this, you end up with a really, really cool way to be able to conceptualize your things. Okay? And then that leads to design work and digital and everything. And that will eventually lead to every single way of art being able to be composed in a way that's cool. Doesn't matter if it's complicated or just a sketch or if it's something that you need to do for comic books or clients, you know? All that, oh, that just came out. That is not good. I think Mustache uh, had a little go at this book. Learning time, let's make a sci-fi poster. And then I teach you guys a little bit of how I would approach something like that. Okay. I have built entire empires for people. Um, I have used my abilities to be able to create massive amounts of wealth for some people. And, you know, at some point in my life, I decided to stop doing that for them. 
just because I wanted not to make wealth for myself, but because I just got tired of making other people's dreams come true when no one put any effort into helping me make mine come true. You know what I mean? Like I, like I started adopting my, my endeavors of, um, yeah, you don't help me, uh, I'm just not going to help you type of situation. So that is uh, why I stopped working for production companies, but I did a very long bout, and I might have to go back at some point due to just like life and some medical expenses and stuff like that. But if I do, I'm fully prepared to be able to tackle anything anybody prepares in front of me. I've built empires <laughs> for people. I, I, I don't think I have an issue going into a workforce. I just really hope that I didn't have to anymore. I really, really wished it, it, it was a, uh, I really wish that I could just be a teacher again and we're just fucking find a job as a teacher instead of having to go be a production monkey for somebody. But, oh, all right, mustache, here you go. I told myself if I got angry, I'm going to give you an apple. So here you go. You get apple now. All right, let's continue. Okay, so finally our lesson, right? Like a 30 minutes, 40 minutes into our fucking stream. <laughs> let's begin our lesson now. All right, so liter what, what, what do you say? What do you say? Bro, you just need to start your own online account. Oh, oh, I'm doing that already. I'm already doing that. Oh, you have no idea. Side quest number two. Check it out. So I have partnered up with a company. And uh, we're going to be doing every single one of these and then some. And each one of these is going to be a, a full-on course. A full-on course based on what I teach, how I want to teach it, how I want to do it, how I want to produce it, how I want to edit it. And I, now I, I'm going to have a full production team behind me. So I am incredibly stoked to say that we have uh, a gigantic amount of lessons going into, um, yeah, yeah. So production will start soon. I, I got to start getting uh, the equipment and stuff like that for it. But uh, like I said, good things are coming. Good things are coming. So hopefully this counteracts anything bad that has happened uh, financially. Because if it does, it's just amazing. But if not, it's just going to be another thing to talk on to my to-do list. But we'll see. Hopefully. Hopefully that actually uh, works out. July 27th, I believe I am here. Anyways, the Mr. The Gray has also speak Spanish or Spanish if you... Oh, I, yeah, I'm Spanish. I'm Mexican. So I am bilingual. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about Mr. Mello. Mr. Mello is going to be our drawing exercise for drawing little overlapping characters. What can you possibly do with these little overlapping characters? Well, I'm going to show you. Do, 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 do. This is also going to take into consideration the box method, right? So later on, you're going to be able to use this to be able to draw really cute, adorable things. Now, the first part of Mr. Mello is understanding that Mr. Mello is two boxes, but two circles and two cylinders combined. What do I mean by that? Mr. Mello can be a box, can be a circle, or it could be a cylinder. It doesn't matter which way you visualize them, you can get the same result either way. Mr. Mello is two of these shapes combined, but we normally only dissect the top part in two fours. The reason that we dissect the top part into fours is because most of the human structures or animal structures or things with two eyes have this similar system. We have two eye sockets 
and we normally have some sort of nose canal or chin, if you are human. If we combine that with a body about similar size, right, and if we don't make this into a human, <laughs> with this way you can make a neck really easy, <laughs> right? If you are drawing a human, that becomes a neck, but if you're not drawing a human, that can become the body. So understanding this shape will help you and facilitate your journey immensely. So Mr. Mello is a very important lesson to learn if you eventually want to become a better designer. Okay? <laughs> do, do, do. Okay, let's zoom in a little bit more. All right, so Mr. Mellow can be turned into different things. I personally, I like making them into little furry animal creatures. Right? That is my favorite thing. I like to draw my little companions to my pinups by drawing them like this. And I just really, really enjoy the proportions of one-to-one. -one. So Mr. Mello will stay within those ranges. Now, whatever you do with Mr. Mello, the important part is understanding that he is a flexible character. But most of the flexibility is going to come from the bottom part of your body. Imagine that the top is a solid, stiff rock. It doesn't move, it doesn't shift, it doesn't move and do anything. It's grounded, right? This is going to consist of, normally, this would consist of your skull, if you're a human, or in this case, it's just going to consist of where the eyes and the mouth would be if I was drawing something like a little bear. If it was a human, you would add the chin. That's simple. Human, a little bit more depth, about double the size of here, and you add a chin. If you're just drawing little cute animals, you don't need to add that extra stuff. Okay? If you add that extra stuff, it's actually really easy to do it. Check it out. <laughs> Wherever this goes, this is going to be the base of your skull. If that's a human. That's going to be the base of your skull. So from there, you go forward, and that's where your nose ends up. This top part divided into two, and that's about the limitations of the ranges of where your features are going to go. Your neck, this is your neck, this is all your neck. So you have to draw yourself a jaw that goes around the neck. The neck could be tapered down. You don't have to necessarily make it that thick, but it helps you have a nice big guideline. So later on, you're gonna be able to use that to do this, okay? But for now, just focus on the top part being nice and solid, where you put a little split in half, and then you choose a little shape for the front of your face. I like a triangle because it's a nice and even like guidelines to the rest of the face. But you can choose little circles, you can choose a box, whatever makes it easier for you to understand. At the edge of wherever you draw your eyeball, or your eyeball not, or your eye socket, or your eyeball, depends on how you decide to use that. Okay? At the edge of that, that is the side of your face. In this case, you can make it as wide as you want. Right? You can always make it bigger, smaller, whatever you want. At the edge of this circle, that's where this circle on the side goes. It also happens to be at the edge of your eyebrow. So wherever your eyebrow hits, that is the side of your face. If you have your eyebrow, 
that is the side of your face. It happens naturally as a three quarter. Okay, wherever that touches, that is the side of your face. And the side of your face ends at the bottom of your nose. So understanding those little mapping features is good. Now, understanding that this is literally just three circles. Three circles, okay? So we're going to draw one, two, three circles. Those three circles, if drawn together, they're going to look like a normal cylinder, right? If we draw one bigger, one smaller, and one about the same, our character is now going to be shifted in space. Now, our character is moving. If we overlap these a little bit more, get them closer to each other, we end up getting even more movement. We can decide, like I said, these are all ambiguous. So I can choose to make any of these, the front, the top, the bottom, and I can create a lot of movement by just choosing a slightly different way to draw one of them. They give you the compression lines you need to be able to move your element around. Just follow the circles and see what happens when you get a bunch of compression lines. When you start adding more elements, this is the nature of clothes with folds and stuff. Okay, this is the nature of how it works. You start understanding these, and you're gonna start understanding how your clothing folds and how all that stuff happens. Understanding these things isn't magic. It's not like people just magically come up with these lines. A lot of the times we use style to be able to kind of like bullshit our way through it. But once we understand little by little and you build it up, you're gonna be able to eventually create things like clothing. This is also the way that you create things like arms. Okay, overlapping shapes and slight overlapping lines can give you legs, they can give you fingers, right? And they can give you entire like, hands, arms, shoulders, knees, toes. Once you understand them, remember how we talked about the circles to be able to draw a hand? The circle is just the beginning of a cylinder. You can choose the depth, the distance, whatever type of style you choose. It doesn't matter. Once you understand these little overlapping shapes and you practice them enough, you'll be able to create so much depth from nothing. Like literally just a couple overlapping lines will be all you need to be able to generate all the depth you need. It's incredible. It really is. It, it becomes an incredibly t easy tool to be able to master. But you have to constantly play around with these type of problems and examples, right? You can't just think about doing this without any sort of practice. This is just something that's going to be constantly happening in your life, and you're going to have to normally understand how to do these things. If if you want to unlock those parts of your body, like those parts of your imagination that allow you to do that. You can go your whole career without them. 
your whole career, you can go without understanding any of this. And you would never be blamed or judged or anything. But if you want to get better and you want to get better at it, like we all should, that's why we do this. No, I mean, not mean. Circle, circle, connect the dots. Circle, circle, draw it a lot. <laughs> Add a face if you want. Add some arms and some leggies, and it's a little tater tot. <laughs> well, his little tater tot or his little cre uh, creation that he drew is a very cute little cylinder that has really big eyes. Right? So once you have something like this, you can just break this down into two big shapes. The one big box that has the eyes on the bottom, so a big box that has a split and that has the eyes on the bottom, and then another box that's going in a slightly different direction to give it a base. So I'm gonna make this a little bit wider to make it look like he's touching the ground, right? I round out the shape and I give him a little compression point at the middle point right here. Just like that, I have his little breakdown easy. If I wanna add the other eye because it's really bulgy, I can just draw another circle the same size, but just overlapping it. Okay. The same size. Don't make them smaller. If you make them smaller, it's going to look weird. Okay, so that's the body. His body is going to be two boxes or two cylinders or two circles, and then the top one is going to have the eyes. So now I understand a little bit of overlapping shapes. So now I'm just going to overlap these shapes a tiny bit. And now I have a little tater tot in the front view. Give them some eyebrows, make a lightly thicker line on top to make it look like he has eyelashes. And then I can give him a little mouth. And now I pay attention to where the little mouth is in comparison to this. Half, half the eye. Cool. So wherever half of my eye is, that's going to be where my mouth is. Dope. Now I just need to find the middle of my eye. If I need to open my eye, I just open this up a little bit more. And it reaches a little bit further. Perfect. I have everything I need to be able to create my character now in different positions. Draw one box one way. Draw another shape the other. My eyes have to stay within the first half. Ooh, he's going to be looking at something. Ooh, overlapping lines. Put one on the ground. Maybe he's doing like a push up. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Let's make his eyes really big. <laughs> So two overlapping lines. I overlap them the same way, but I change the midline. Now he has a completely different. Ta-da! Parkour! So understanding just that the same shape and just changing the direction of lines can give you a completely different character. Same compression point, same compression point. Let's change the compression point from that side. Let's change it to that. So that splits that. This is half. My eye fits in half. Now I have a character looking at a completely different direction. And a little bit from underneath. Uh, 
Wait, what? Okay, for some reason, Mr. Tater Tot reminds me of VeggieTales. <laughs> yeah, essentially, I mean, it's pretty much that. It, it kind of looks like a little bit of VeggieTales. But VeggieTales kind of... <laughs> uh, so. Ooh, I just got a caricature gig. Sweet. Now I get to go do caricatures of people. Uh, if you guys don't know what a uh, caricature is, it's one of those uh, people. I'm one of those people that go to parties and draw people like silly. Or fun, or cute, or whatever they like really want. Uh, I'm really, really good at it. <laughs> I'm an incredibly talented character artist. And I used to teach people how to do this. Uh, I essentially lived my life uh, hustling, doing caricatures for a very long time because I didn't really know my value as an artist yet when I was younger. And I would, it was the only way that I could make money while still not having to have a job, <laughs> right? Because I was in college. I didn't want to go to like, I didn't want to have too many jobs. Uh, so I would do caricatures and go downtown close to the bars and I would just draw people as they left. And I got really good at drawing people quick, like really abnormally good. Like, you, you would be super surprised if anybody took me more than, like, a minute to draw. Honestly, it's, it's an insane skill that I know that not many people have. <laughs> but it's just something that has always made me money. <laughs> so being able to do this quickly for people uh, always has generated income for me. And people still hire me to this day to be able to do that sort of stuff. To parties and stuff like that. And it's normally a pretty decent amount of money. Uh, depending, I normally charge about like 150 an hour. And they normally book me for like two hours. I love those. I've always wanted to try it out for a little time. Do it. Try it. I mean, the parks, the parks where you normally get the jobs, yeah, they're going to pay shit. Absolute garbage. But if you just go downtown or go to a mall and just feel like a fun afternoon, you just feel like having a nice, fun evening for yourself, that's going to be a little challenging and at the same time a little like nerve-wracking and you're going to be like super happy and stoked anyways, even if you fail. Go to the mall and just sit at the food court and then draw people as they eat their food. You have the amount of time since they sit down to when they finish eating, to draw them to the best of your abilities. And if you, you still can't draw them, like if you can't finish before then, you just give them the drawing anyways. You're going to give them the drawing anyways. That's the whole point. You get to draw them anyways. You're going to give them the drawing anyways. So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what you draw. You just have to do your best. And it takes away all the nerves that you end up getting Whenever you have to present things to clients later on or you have to do like public speaking, you'll be so unfazed by all that. But you need to uh, actively train yourself to do that. How many can you do in an hour? Uh, on average, I spend about 30 seconds to 45 seconds per caricature. Sometimes a minute. Sometimes. Like, I'm really quick, dude. Like, I'm, I'm an abnormality in this field. Like, I... Me and a bunch of people that worked at the same time, we are uh, considered, like, a golden generation. <laughs> Kind of like the miracle generation of caricatures because we all went on to be like something in our industries. Uh, and we are still seen by some of the people in the end, like since all, a lot of our art is still in the parks and still like they still have it on that booth. I, I just took a picture of it like recently that I went to see a platypus. They still had my art. They still have my art displayed. 
even though I haven't worked for them in like 12 years. And it's just because it's, uh, it's appealing. I remember going to Italy, right? And then there's like this market where everybody like gets, uh, you know, like their art on. And I remember seeing a caricature artist that had my pictures saying that it was his. And I was like, oh my God, what are the odds of this? That's amazing. And then I went and I asked him to get a drawing because, you know, of course. And then I drew him as he was drawing me. And then I was like, oh, my drawing looks a lot more like the one that you have here than yours. And then I just gave him some shit, you know, I was like, we just laughed about it. And I was like, fuck, yeah, dude, get your money on. <laughs> but but make sure that you put some of your own pictures up there, you know, like nobody wants to be like catfished by an artist. Yeah, that's that's never going to be like good. Cool. But yeah, I got myself a character gig. Dope, on the 27th. That'll be a nice little amount of extra. Since in August, I'm going to be going to Vegas for my pool championships. So if you guys don't know, I play competitive pool, uh, which is eight ball, nine ball, and the sorts. And I am quite good at it. I am quite adept at it. Quite good. So, so I'm going to this like nationals. So that'll be fun. Do do do. Ooh, I'm excited. <laughs> it's funny how you can just tell an emotion by just doing it. Uh, sorry about that, man. I was on vacation. I try to sketch as well when I'm. Uh, yeah, you draw whenever you can, dude. Best of luck with that event. Yeah. When is that? Ooh, uh, it's the APA National Championships. I believe it's August. The ones that I'm competing on is August 13th through the 17th, I think. Yeah, I, I get to design my own cool pool logo. So I got to make a new nine ball logo for my team. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to draw. The last one I drew, it was like a leprechaun because we are uh, based out of like this Irish bar. So I don't know, maybe I'll draw like a leprechaun holding up something like the nine ball. Of course, a leprechaun has to be me because my ego does not allow me to not get something printed with my face on it. <laughs> Uh, he has his coat floating up. And then nine ball, blah, 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 blah. Then whatever team name. And then whatever team we have right here. Maybe have like the stick back here, like a sword. Yeah. <laughs> that would be kind of cool. Anyways, anyways, I'm getting too distracted. I'm getting too distracted, and I, like, my daydreaming gets really crazy sometimes. Uh, anyways, uh, let's go back to our lesson. So this guy can be cylinders, like we explained. It could be boxes, or it could just be circles. If you just draw two circles overlapping each other, you get the same result. Okay, so however it is that you visualize them, it doesn't hurt to try the other ways to see if it actually is something that you could possibly use a little bit better. The other thing that I've learned to use is if you do use guidelines like these, using the connecting points as a matter of like understanding how this would work, like sample this, right? Really big eyes means that this would have a really big eye socket. That means that if it did have a structure for its skeleton, it would be like that. So I always like to think of the anatomy behind what I'm drawing. Okay? I like to think of the anatomy so that whenever I go to do things like facial expressions and stuff like that, 
I have a sense of how even something as simple as that would have structure. That's why I was saying that the top part of your head doesn't really flex, right? This doesn't really flex, it doesn't really move, and it doesn't really change much when it comes down to different characters. This becomes your eye socket, your nose canal, and if you wanted to draw a human, you would draw a chin. If not, you could draw a little body. If you're just drawing something like a cute little animal, that's all you need. You don't need anything super complex. A box, two circles, and that's it. <laughs> A box, split it in four, two circles, and if you want depth, you add an extra circle. Congratulations, you have leveled up considerably after today. If you followed along, if you followed along and you actually paid attention, this should be a lot easier for you to be able to visualize. And I hope that it has helped you all understand a little bit more about how to create depth through overlapping shapes. I hope that Mr. Mellow or Mr. Marshmallow uh, has been a good learning tool for you. And I hope that you implement it into something fun for yourselves. Uh, the whole point of teaching these things is to eventually show you how powerful two overlapping lines can be. Okay? Two overlapping lines, if presented in different parts of your body, overlapping line, overlapping line, overlapping line, overlapping line, overlapping line, overlapping line. Everything in your body becomes an overlapping shape. Okay? Everything. From down to your fingers. Everything that you have in your body can be represented through overlapping shapes. Everything. Now, the ability to unlock that is going to take a little creativity from your end. And it's going to require a little bit of just visualizing and understanding how body parts move. But at the end of the day, all you really need to know to be able to generate the depth you need is overlapping shapes, and you can at least get to this level. Okay, the power of the Digon. <laughs> yeah, I just learned that these that I draw all the time, that's a Digon. It's something that gives you depth, visualization, perception, depth, cuts a single shape in two without really slicing it, right? So you can use it as guidelines. You can use it to understand where one ear goes, where the other one goes. You can understand how to draw things upside down, front side up. By just understanding that simple shape, it's so good. <laughs> You know, it was so good. And I didn't know what it was called until recently. <laughs> so, yeah. So today, let's recall what we learned. Okay? So today, we learned how to draw an actual face from a happy face. How to use a happy face system as a mapping system. so that you may be able to draw things in different positions without having to overthink it, okay? Being able to draw in way different angles doesn't have to be any harder than learning how to draw a happy face in that space, okay? Every single time we draw a happy face, we're drawing a mapping system. We just don't know it. We already draw where the eyes go, we're drawing where the mouth goes, and all you need to do is figure out where your nose goes. But at the end of the day, it's another mapping system. It's kind of like the, the little circles and boxes things that we do. 
but we're using a visual cue instead of using the lines. We're using a circle, two dots, and a line to generate the implied situation that we need to draw. It's no different than doing this. Okay? It's the same thing. You could do a happy face on the line and then use that to be able to draw your faces. And then now you have two mapping systems instead of one. Ta-da! Yeah, this will be on YouTube. Understanding how to draw a happy face teaches you how to draw a profile. Ta-da! You don't have to overcomplicate things. If you can get a simple happy face right, and that's the inside of your eye, pull your eye out, and then draw your face. When you learn about perspective, you'll learn a little bit more about how to generate depth. But it doesn't have to be much more complicated than that. It really doesn't. If you practice your foundations, AKA drawing circles and guidelines and drawing things like this, eventually that teaches you how to draw more complicated things in space too. Okay. Thank you so much for being my students. Thank you so much for paying attention and thank you for letting me be a teacher. Um, my life goal is to be a teacher at a college at some point. So if you guys do know someone, I'm not afraid to ask for help. If you guys do know somebody that's hiring for art teachers at a college level, at a college level, please, uh, let them know that I'm willing to relocate, I'm willing to move, I'm willing to actually, as, as long as they pay a livable wage, man. As long as they pay a livable wage, I want to do it. I want to live as an artist teacher for a while. So I'm putting it out there into the world. I don't know if it'll ever manifest. Hopefully it does. But if anybody's interested in having me as a teacher, help me out a little. I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing when it comes down to that. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not good at that side of things. So I'm not afraid to ask for help in that regards. And I, it seems like I might have to actually find employment soon. So uh, any help you guys can offer, that'd be amazing. <laughs> Anyways, uh, you guys have a lovely time. Uh, as always, the best part of my day is being your teacher. So you guys have a lovely time. I'll see you guys a little later today for maybe another lesson. Uh, I might stream again. Uh, I'm really just enjoying drawing simple characters. Honestly, just, just drawing really simple, cute characters right now has been like so insanely fun. Insanely fun. It's just like... We, we, we told ourselves we we're going to focus on style, character, application, and environmental, and clothing. That is the whole sketchbook's going to be that. So by the end of our, we will have refined a shit ton of styles by the time we were done with this sketchbook. It's going to take about a month and a half. We're going to refine every single one of our styles. We're going to go in through every single one of our OCs. We're going to make everything look just Ugh, and it, this is just a stepping stone into creating a whole uh, concept book. Like what I want to eventually do is get every one of my sketchbooks to be able to be refined to a whole, the art of this book, the art of that book, because I want to eventually do them as pitch books for my stories. If I have an entire sketchbook full of concepts, do you think that that wouldn't be enough to be able to actually like push that concept to life. Imagine I just gave you a whole entire book, like, done, here you go, here's my idea. Just, just enjoy. I will, have a, I will have a show soon. I will have a show once that's done. I, I might make that for Bernie. I might do that for Bernie. That, that would be fucking awesome. Make HBO like an R-rated, like, happy tree friends type of cartoon 
where he just goes around killing dragons and making them his living space. <laughs> All while teaching you valuable lessons. Don't be a snitch. Snitches get stitches. <laughs> that would be hilarious. Anyways, <laughs> you guys have a lovely day. Uh, ooh, I have furniture coming in today too. I'm excited. I have, a, I have a, finally a TV stand. I finally, oh my fucking God, I finally like told myself I'm gonna spend a little money. Like I, I, I bought myself something that's fucking crazy. Like it's only like a hundred dollar fucking piece of furniture, but it's like, like I bought myself something and I'm, I feel so terribly bad. Like, I feel like, like guilty as shit, but I'm happy, but I'm feeling it. And I'm like regretting it. And at the same time, I'm like excited. Ah, I don't know. I don't, I don't like doing things for myself. That's why I don't do things for myself. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> That's why I picture your tunes come to life. Uh, work hard, get help, make your dreams. I do all that. Have you seen Larva? Larva, huh? I'm gonna check that out. It's so funny. Check out Larva. I bought myself a desk. I'm so happy. Woohoo! That's awesome. The desk is the first step. Here, you guys wanna see my setup? I just cleaned up. So I have my light. I have my tripod thingy. That is, has to be separate from the desk, guys. Remember, it has to be separate from the desk because when you draw, you move the desk. So it. If you have it on the same desk, it's going to move every time you draw. So you keep it separate from it so that it doesn't do that. Now, we have our hub. We have our big screen TV. We have our stuff that keeps us happy. We have all our sketchbooks. All our recent sketchbooks, at least. Then we have our backdrop. Our backdrop contains everything that inspires us. And then I have my favorite piece of art. <laughs> Vicky's booty. <laughs> yes, so let me flip this over first, because I think you guys get a little bit more foot camera. Oh, hello, everybody. This is the person behind the hand. How are you guys doing? Ooh, this makes my like, it has like a natural filter or something. I look good. Anyways, <laughs> you guys, thank you so much for keeping up with me. Thank you so much for tolerating me. Thank you so much for learning from me. Um, if I had to say something, I just want to say thank you. Um, even though, even though circumstances might change for me soon, uh, and I might not be able to stream every day, uh, I'm still gonna stream as much as I can, and I'm going to just work and save up until I can try to do this again, and again, and again, and again, until I can actually succeed. That's it. That's it. Everything. I'll see you guys later. What happened to my hair? Well, I lost it, dude. <laughs> but I look good, bald. I look good. I like it more. Later, Gators. Take care.